Good morning. Happy Friday. Uh, I hope your first week went well. Love having you in class. Let's talk about equilibrium a little bit. But first, an advertisement Monday at 1.10. Uh, bring your completed equilibrium constant lab. I've been seeing some of your work and it looks really good. Really, really pleased. Uh, check that out. Also on Monday at 1.10, the one page, honestly a little bit cheesy, introduce yourself in class lab is due. This is a lab that will make up for the week we miss uh, for Memorial Day. It's very simple. You don't have to make a video. I've been asked that a couple times by people uh, in, in my two face-to-face -face classes. If you have, if you're reading something about making a video, that's the W1, the online version. Make sure that yours is the in-class version. It should be really, really simple. If you can't find it, I'll send you a direct link, stuff like that. Uh, Problem set one is up on Monday. We'll talk about it. Try to bring uh, your problems to, completed to the ability, and we'll talk about it. You'll self-correct it and stuff before you turn it in. Quiz number one follows, uh, about half an hour in length. Uh, there's an example quiz in the companion and online you can see. And then we'll go next door and do the Le Chatelier's principle in-class lab. Again, make sure that yours is the in-class version. The online one is quite different. Um, if you have it there printed out, you can just fill it out as we go through and be good to go. And finally, if you haven't done so already, try to pick your class presentation topic by next week, Friday, 9 a.m. It's a little bit faster, something in science that interests you. Some of you have already done this, which is awesome, but if you haven't done it, try to do it by next Friday. Emailing me uh, a topic or two that you think sounds good is all you have to do for that. Should be pretty chill. Questions on anything? All right. Equilibrium. Products divided by reactants. If there's a stoichiometry other than one, you square it, triple it, whatever it says like that. Don't include solids and liquids. The value of K, we talked about on Wednesday, actually tells you if it's more product favored or reactant favored. So this K is greater than one. There are things, there's more product, more HI for this reaction at equilibrium than there would be H2 and I2. And that'll be helpful to us coming up. Now, some of the calculations we're going to talk about today, you do need the quadratic formula. Uh, when I was in school back in the day, you know, I walked uphill both coming and going to school, whatever. Anyway, when I was back in the day, quadratic formula, you know, minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. But Wow, you all might have, if you do, that solve function on your calculator. And that makes mincemeat of the quadratic. So I really don't care how you solve these, all right? You can do my way, old school. You can also use the solve button, but this will be something that you'll wanna do once in a while. Now that being said, I'm gonna share all of my tricks with you on how to avoid using the quadratic formula and the solve function, all right? Sometimes they'll work, they won't work all the times, but there are quite a few of them that I'm gonna share with you today. So, without further ado, we're placing a mole of H2 and a mole of I2 in a one liter flask. Remember, everything with square brackets like that is gonna be moles per liter molarity. So that means they're both starting at one mole per liter. We can use this information and the equilibrium constant to calculate the equilibrium concentrations of HI, H2, and I2. And at this point, what we can say is that the H2 and I2 will be less than one mole per liter because equilibrium means reactants are going to products. We can also say that at equilibrium, we'll probably end up with more HI than we have H2 and I2. But more than that, we'll have to do some math and stuff to figure out. Any questions on anything I've just said? So when you, have, when you see a problem like this, first thing to do is set up the ICE table. ICE stands for Initial Change in Equilibrium. And again, what I recommend doing is that you put the reactants on the left and the products on the right. Um, keep them together because uh, the change part, like one side will be minus in the change and the other side will be positive. And I'll show you that here in a little bit. 
So for this problem, you're starting with one mole per liter H2 and one mole per liter I2, and you don't have any HI. Now, change. Notice the changes. First of all, reactants are negative, products are positive here. That's because you don't start with any HI. And at equilibrium, you have to have some of everything. So this has to go up, all right? Negative mass doesn't flow in chemistry. So this is going to be positive. Excuse me, these two will be negative. Also notice the stoichiometry there. The one, one, two is exactly what you'll see in the change part, all right? So if you had two moles, three moles, and four moles, you'd see minus two X, minus three X, plus four X, that kind of thing. And then at equilibrium, you just literally combine these. So one minus X for both H2 and I2, and two X for the HI. So we've got one equation with one unknown x. That's where we're kind of going with this. And in math, if you have one equation with one unknown, you can totally solve it. Question so far. OK. So at equilibrium, then, the HI is 2x, and we square it. So notice here another thing that's if you're new to equilibrium. The 2 shows up in two places. It was plus 2x. That was one of the places the 2 shows up. But it also shows up there in the equilibrium expression itself. So you're going to have 2x quantity squared. And in the bottom, you're going to have 1 minus x for H2 and 1 minus x for I2. OK? Questions on that part? OK. Now, on this problem, let me go back. You could absolutely solve this as a quadratic, all right? This would be 4x squared. You'd have 1 minus x quantity squared on the bottom equal 55.3. And you could solve this as a quadratic. A quadratic means you have an x squared term, an x term, and a number equals 0. And you can go from there. But this is one of the hints you can do sometimes. Notice how on the top we have 2x quantity squared, and the bottom is essentially 1 minus x quantity squared. Well, what I would do here, instead of running to the quadratic, is just square root both sides. The square root of 55.3 is just a number. All right, I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but that's what your calculator is for, 7.44. And 2x quantity squared, if you square root that, is just 2x. And the bottom was 1 minus x quantity squared. Square root of that, and it's 1 minus x. So this is one way that you can sometimes get around the quadratic expression. Now, there's nothing wrong with plugging it in your solve function on your calculator if you have it, and you could do that. On the other hand, I would not do that. So this is now a lot simpler than a quadratic. You don't need, you know, minus b plus or minus square root, all that jazz. Um, if you solve for this, multiply both sides by 1 minus x. So the 1 minus x in the bottom goes away, and you then have 7.44 times 1 minus x. And you can distribute this. So 7.4 times 1 is 7.44 times minus x is that equals 2x. Combine all the x's to one side. You get 9.44x equals 7.44. Solve for x. x comes out to be 0.788. So at equilibrium, 1 minus that number is how much of the H2 and I2 you're going to have, 0.21. And HI is 2 times this number, or 1.58. So my first little hint here is that to avoid the quadratic, sometimes if you square root both sides, uh, you'll get an answer that makes sense. Now, this doesn't always work, all right? But square rooting both sides is something that's done sometimes with equilibrium. Finally, equilibrium is kind of a trip. You're like, oh, man, Russell, am I on target? Well, remember that the value of k will sometimes give you a hint as to if your answers make sense. And if k is greater than 1, you should usually have more product than you have reactant. And that's absolutely what we see here. The HI is 1.58, which is quite a bit bigger than 0.21, all right? So that's another way to kind of verify what's going on. 
And if you really, really want to verify, you can plug these values back into K and you should get an answer pretty close to 55.3. So this number squared divided by uh, uh, the one, uh, 0.21 times 0.21, I'm hoping gives you 55.3. Questions? It was a Friday at Dartmouth. I was trying to get done in lab because I wanted to go to the <coughs> library and study journals. Not. Anyway, I, I wanted to get out of lab. I didn't want to stick around. So uh, in my world, we used a lot of metals, all right? And what you're supposed to do with metals when you're trying to clean your glassware is you let them sit in a base bath, and after a while, then you put them into the acid bath. Well, I was in a hurry, and again, I wanted to get out of there and uh, <clears throat> go study science journals on a Friday night. So anyway, I didn't let it sit in the base bath for even close to long enough time. So I put it right into the acid bath, and thank the stars, I was listening to reggae, and I was like, oh, I'm going to turn this song up. Literally, this is a true story. So I had my hand in the bucket of acid, well, not literally in the bucket, but it was close to the bucket, and I literally was doing this, and whoosh, this big thing of brown gas went up and oh my goodness that brown gas was nitrogen dioxide and if I would have been right over the bucket which I had been like seconds before it causes edema in the lungs it's all kinds of bad things so reggae can be good for you all right, I was just lucky, let's be honest. But anyway, prop hat back on. This problem is especially uh, useful to me uh, because it reminds me of how lucky I was. Uh, in my case, it was nitric acid and tin metal, and the tin made the nitric acid turn into nitrogen dioxide, and it was... Anyway, it's a cool brown color, <laughs> but I don't recommend you find out as I do. So, profit back on, which has nothing to do with my previous story. This is an equilibrium you can look at too. Dinitrogen tetroxide, if you draw out a Lewis structure, is diamagnetic, very, very stable. All right, has no, doesn't have a color or anything like that. But nitrogen dioxide, if you draw out a Lewis structure, is paramagnetic. The nitrogen has an odd electron. It's a lot more reactive. That's why if you get the NO2 in your body, uh, it can cause some pretty serious chaos. Um, this is an equilibrium. The two NOs, NO2s, will combine to make N2O4. And N2O4 is more stable, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> NO2 has a brown color. The paramagnetic part makes it very, very brown. On the other hand, the N2O4 has no color at all. We're gonna see there's a temperature dependence. We'll talk about that later. So you can see at the colder temperature, that's ice right there, there's less brown. That means there's more N2O4. On the other hand, when you have a warmer temperature, like this one right here, you have more brown. My brown that I saw was very, very dark brown. And uh, anyway, but sorry, PTSD is still a problem. I'm there. Prof that back on. Any questions? I'm babbling a lot this morning. I'm really sorry. All right. This equilibrium has been studied a lot. Not by me, I'm scared of it. But anyway, in this reaction, they looked at NO2 as a product and N2O4 as a reactant. So K is NO2 quantity squared. N2O4 is the reactant in the denominator. And this value was found to be 0.0059 at 298 Kelvin, which is room temperature. So knowing this number, at room temperature, if we had a big fish tank here filled with this equilibrium, would you expect to see more brown NO2 or would it be closer to a colorless color? Colorless. Colorless, well done. And how Jake came up with that is that this K is less than one. So anytime you have a K value less than one, the reactant will be favored over the product. N2O4 is colorless. This is the scary brown color that I saw. So at room temperature, this number will tell you that, yeah, you, should, you shouldn't see anything. It should be more, you won't see that much of the brown NO2. It'll be more of the N2O4. Questions on that? Okay, so <clears throat> let's say we have some N2O4 and we'll assume it's 298 Kelvin. The initial concentration, 0 0.50 moles per liter. What are the equilibrium concentrations? All right, well again, equilibrium means you're gonna have both species. Nothing's gonna be zero. 
So in this problem, the N2O4 will be decreasing and the NO2 will be increasing. So if you set up the equilibrium constant, initial change in equilibrium, here's our initial N2O4, and initially there's no NO2. Now, remembering that you can't have zero concentrations of anything in equilibrium, will the N2O4 have a negative or a positive uh, X right there? Negative. Negative, well done. The N2O4 has to go away a little bit to make the NO2. Remember, there's no zero amounts when it comes to equilibrium in chemistry. The other thing is that because there's a 2 to 1 ratio of NO2 to N2O4, this will go up by 2x, while the N2O4 will go down by x. So at equilibrium, 0 0.50 minus x, NO2 is positive 2x or 2x. Any questions on that? Okay. So you can set this also equal to the equilibrium constant K, 0 0.0059. 2x for NO2, we square that as well. Remember, the 2 shows up in two different places. And in the bottom, you've got 0 0.50 minus x. Now on the previous example with H2 and I2, this quantity was squared because there were two reactants. We don't have that luxury right here, so we can't take the square root for it. This is not a problem I have a quick and dirty for. So this one, we're gonna have to rearrange into a quadratic formula, or you can use the solve button. So if you wanna do it the traditional quadratic way, you wanna get all the x squared terms together, you wanna get the x terms together and the number, and let all of them equal zero. So when you rearrange this, this times this quantity gives you all of this. Uh, I usually have the x squared term positive, but it doesn't really matter. Push this into your calculator, and this is what you can do. Now in the quadratic, all right, <clears throat> when you have a quadratic formula, the number in front of the x squared is usually the a, the number in front of the x is the b, and the number in front of the, uh, the, the number that's by itself is the c. So if you do it this way and stuff, then you get A, B, and C. Now, if you do a quadratic manually or on the, comp or on the calculator slash computer, you will get two values. And please report both values when you do a quadratic. All right, I wanna know that you get them both and that you also, as we'll talk about here in a little bit, that you know which one is the correct version to use. Any questions? Has anybody here not seen the quadratic? Okay. If you haven't, let me know. There's tutorials, blah, blah, blah. Or if you don't remember your own name as I do. Anyway, this is the quadratic formula. Minus b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And again, in my world, this is what we would use. We would put each of those values like this is a, b goes a couple places and stuff. Plus or minus mean there's going to be two values, all right? That's where the two values come from. Uh, yeah, you can graph it and all that kind of cool stuff they do nowadays, too. So this is what it looks like mathematically. B minus B is this, 2A, 2 times 4, et cetera, et cetera. And when you do the math long ways, this is what you end up with. So you've got a negative number plus or minus this number right here. So you th throw this all in your calculator, and you'll probably do it more efficiently than I'm showing you right here, which is fantastic. In this case, you end up with two roots, all right? One is a positive number, and one is a negative number. Um, so before I talk about that, any questions about how the quadratic works, per se? Cool. Now, the nice thing about chemistry is that because we deal with grams, and grams lead to moles, and moles is molarity, et cetera, et cetera, you can't have negative mass. All right, so negative roots will never fall, never fly when it comes to chemistry. So in this case, you'd report both values, but just like cross out that one or cross it, you know, do something like that. Because a negative doesn't make any sense when it comes to chemistry. So the only value here that makes sense for chemists is positive 0 0.026. 
So if x is 0 0.026, then the N204, 0 0.50 minus that number, 0.47 moles per liter. And the NO2 here would be 2 times the x, 0 0.052. Now, at the end of the day, once again, you can check yourself. Uh, we saw that the K value was much less than one, and that means you're gonna have more N2O4 at equilibrium than you have NO2. And certainly, that's what we see. This number is a lot bigger than this number, all right? So you can use the value of K sometimes to make sure that your numbers are meaningful. Uh, they're not crazy. And finally, if you do a quadratic and you get a positive and a negative, the negative one is always out of here. Always out of here. Now, in the problem set for next week, there's a, another quadratic we're going to do where you get two positive roots. All right? If you see two positive answers, then you always want the smaller one. The bigger one, when you go down to here, will do something weird, all right? It'll make like a negative answer right there or something like that. So if you see two positive x's, use the smaller one, all right? The bigger one won't make any sense. But here, we've got a positive and a negative. The negative one is out of here, no negative answers. Any questions on that? Yeah, when would you use the quadratic instead of just the square root of both sides? So this one, you couldn't take the square root um, because, uh, here, let's go back to that equation. <clears throat> There's no way, like a square root of 0.5 minus x, I, I don't know how you do that, man, unless you had a solve button. So on the first one we looked at, if you square root both sides, then you could do that, like you had something squared in the bottom and something squared at the top. So the squares like just go away. But here, it's not, this isn't like squared, all right? So it, that's beyond my mind at this point, <laughs> unless I had the solve button, to, to, totally honest, yeah. So if it's easy for you, that's when you should do it, absolutely. Now, honestly, even in that first one we did, you could have done the, you could have used the solve button there too and done it, okay? But it was easier probably in that case to take the square. So, so play it on here. Other questions? Okay, so quadratic formula, Blah, blah, blah. Make sure you report both of the answers. Other questions? We're going to use equilibrium a lot in M223. But another thing we're going to use a lot is kind of based on uh, equilibrium. And amazingly, it was discovered by a person who was into mining, all right, mining of minerals and stuff like that. And his name, that I've always been told how you pronounce it, Le Chatelier. And Le Chatelier's principle is something that will help us quite a bit, not only in this chapter, but in many, many, many of our future chapters as well. And there's a practical version of it, but we'll talk about what's happening here. Um, if you have an equilibrium going on, NO2 and N2O4 or whatever, lots of things can affect that equilibrium. So I've, I've mentioned a little bit here how temperature affects equilibrium, but if you have a lot of gases running around, volume and pressure changes will absolutely do it. You can change concentrations, you can add and subtract things. All of these will affect equilibrium. And so chemists use this Le Chatelier's principle quite a bit when it comes to figuring out how changes to a reaction will affect the equilibrium. Now, Officially, Le Chatelier's principle says, if a system at equilibrium is disturbed, the system tends to shift its equilibrium position to counter the effect of the disturbance. And I'm sure that's about as clear as mud. So, uh, let's say, uh, oh gosh, I have a nephew, he's young and he's always really glad to see me but he like comes up to me and, goes, oh! and he like comes right up and I'm whoa <laughs> like that's my initial reaction uh, believe it or not that's kind of Le Chatelier's principle because you know I see him over there no problem hey what's going on Henry is his name that's neither here nor there anyway but Henry then like run over to me man I'm like <gasps> I'm kind of startled all right and so you can imagine that Henry uh, 
Henry Lachelle. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry, that really cracked me up there. For, oh, all right, prop that back on. I'm offline today for some reason. Anyway, back online. Henry comes over to me. Attention. Anyway, Henry comes over to me, and I'm startled, all right? So he comes over, and he like, gets in my face, and I back away from him a little bit. And believe it or not, that's kind of Lachelle's principle, because Henry and I were in equilibrium. He runs over to me, and I'm not expecting it, so I adjust to what's happening. Happened to, what's happened just between us right now. So in a chemical term, let's say that this is a reaction, the Henry-Michael interaction, and Henry all of a sudden comes over to me. So there's lots more Henry in my world than there was. Well, Michael will then back away, all right? Michael will do something else to kind of get away from it. If I would go to Jacob's face right now and say, Jacob, you know, poor Jacob, he's kind of, I'm so glad you're here, Jacob, don't get me wrong. But if I would get in his face and stuff, he'd be like, what the, all right? As a person gets close, closer to personal space, they kind of back away. And that really is Le Chatelier's principle. Now, let's use a chemical term instead of me trying to anthropomorphize these things. NO2 in equilibrium with N2O4, all right? These two chemicals are happy with the equilibrium constant I showed earlier. But all of a sudden, we add in a lot of NO2, all right? Well, whoa, NO2 gets close, N2O4 backs away. So if you add something to a reaction, it shifts in the opposite direction, all right? So chemically, there's basically two things to think about when it comes to Le Chatelier's. If you add a chemical in, the reaction will shift to the other side. So if you add NO2, the reaction will compensate for what the stress that's being added to it. It's gonna move to the opposite side. So let's go through that again. Add something, moves to the other side. That's the first principle. Second principle, if you take away the N by chemical, the reaction will shift to the side that you've taken things away from. So that's the second thing. You take something away, it moves to try and make more of it. So I'm gonna go through that one more time because it's really important. Add, go to the other side. Remove, it tries to fill in what you remove. If you can get those two parts of Le Chatelet's principle down, everything we're gonna talk about will make sense. So add something, moves to the other side remove something, it tries to fill in what you remove. So it's gonna to shift to this side that you removed. Any questions? Sorry, that was a really weird example. I tried to start there. Okay, let's look at some examples. Carbon dioxide dissolves in soft drinks, uh, 21 and over, uh, some different types of drinks, but same idea. This is the dissolved CO2. All right, so when you pop the top of a can or something like that, it can start to fizz around. This reaction has heat as a product. From Chem 221, Chem 222, is this reaction exothermic or endothermic? Exo, well done. This is a good reminder in Chem 221 and Chem 222. If you have a reaction which is exothermic, heat is being given off, you can write heat as a product, which is what we're doing right here. So this is an exothermic reaction. Another review from Chem 221 and Chem 222. If this is an exothermic reaction, what will be the sign of delta H? Negative, good, that's right. Negative delta H and exothermic go together. Positive delta H and endothermic goes together. So if heat would have been a reactant, that would have been endothermic with a positive delta H. But in this example, heat is a product. That means exothermic, that means delta H is gonna be negative. We will come back to that in future lectures, so it's kind of a cool thing to review. Questions on that? Okay, now back to your soft drink example. The equilibrium constant for this is called, sometimes called a mixed equilibrium because it has both concentration and pressure. You can do that, it's a little awkward, but it is possible. So here it's the CO2 concentration in moles per liter on the product side. We don't include liquids, the pressure of the CO2 on the bottom. So the question is here, what happens if you decrease the temperature? Now, decreasing temperature is like taking away heat. 
you're making their reaction cold. And if you're cold, you probably go to get a coat or a blanket or something like that and put it around. Well, if this reaction starts to get cold, it can't get a blanket out or something like that. But what it can do is make more heat. So if this reaction starts to get cold, it's like taking away the heat. And the reaction's going to try and warm itself up by moving to the side that removes this from. So heat's a product. We're removing heat. This reaction is going to shift to the product side. And if you shift to the product side, your K value is going to get bigger. If you change the temperature, you actually change the value of K. Just like in kinetics, if you change the temperature, you change the little rate constant K. Well, in equilibrium, if you change the temperature, you will actually change the value of K. So in this case, if you decrease the temperature, you're going to move to the right. Now, this is why people usually keep their soft drinks cold, all right? So sodas and beers and all that kind of stuff. Because if you move things to the right, you've got more dissolved CO2. Later on, at the end of a long day of Chemistry 223, you take your drink out of the soft, out of the refrigerator, and you open it up. Well, whoa, now all of a sudden, you're increasing the temperature. You're taking it out of the refrigerator. You're warming it up. You're adding heat to the reaction. So in those kind of cases, then, you're going to see the opposite. So if you take your soft drink out of the fridge, you're warming it up. And warm means you're adding heat. So the other part of Le Chatelier's is if you add something. So if you add something, you move to the other side, you're going to see the dissolved CO2 go out, and the CO2 is going to become a gas. So you pop the top, you hear that kind of sound, that's the CO2 coming out. So to summarize here what's going on, this is the reaction we've got, heat's a product. You cool down the temperature, you're taking away the heat. And if you take something away, the reaction's going to move to the side that you're taking it away from. That's going to be a shift to the right. On the other hand, if you increase the heat, increase the temperature, it's like adding heat, adding a product. And adding something makes it move to the other side. So if you increase the temperature, you're going to move to the left. You're going to have less dissolved CO2 and more CO2 that's free. That's where the fizzing kind of sound comes from. Cool. So again, the punchline of all the Chatelier's, if you add something, like adding heat, it shifts to the opposite side. So because heat's a product, it's going to shift to the reactant side. If it was endothermic, it would be the reverse. On the other hand, if you take something away, which is what you're doing by decreasing the temperature, you're taking away the heat. If you take something away, it moves to the side where the reactant was, trying to make more of it. Any questions? This is our uh, N N204 going to NO2 reaction once again. This reaction has a positive delta H. It's a positive endothermic value. Positive delta H means endothermic. Negative, as we talked about, means exothermic. If it's endothermic, you can literally write heat as a reactant. And that can be kind of helpful. So this is the reaction that's happening. Now, look at these two K values here. This one is about freezing for water, 273. This one is room temperature. And notice how K goes from a, a very, very small value, 10 to the minus 4, to a 10 to the minus 3. If you're getting bigger, all right, which is what's happening here, getting bigger, that means that K is going more and more to the product side. If K gets bigger, you're moving towards a more product-favored K. It's still reactant-favored, even at room temperature, but you are getting more and more uh, closer to the product side. So K literally will change with pressure, with temperature, excuse me. Now in this case, more product here means more brown NO2. So this equilibrium will become more and more brown as you warm it up. 
So when I put my uh, tin metal in my acid and thankfully turned my head, uh, it was incredibly dark brown because that was much warmer, lots and lots of energy being given off. On the other hand, as you get colder and colder, then the reaction's gonna shift to the side with the heat you're gonna see less color. It's gonna be more colorless because of the formation of N2O4. In a sealed flask, we have a mixture of dinitrogen tetroxide, a colorless gas, with the brown gas, nitrogen dioxide. When we heat the flask, however, the dinitrogen tetroxide decomposes into nitrogen dioxide, creating more of the brown gas until equilibrium is reached for the higher temperature. At the warmer temperature, you're adding heat. It shifts to the right. More NO2 relative to N2O4. More ground gas relative to the colorless gas. But you still have N2O4. All right, it's not zero. And that's the weird thing about equilibrium. You still have N2O4. It's just that you have more NO2 than you did at the colder temperature. Any questions? Okay, so here's a reaction in the formation of chlorine trifluoride, which is a real nasty kind of gas. Uh, this can be made by combining, <coughs> excuse me, chlorine and fluorine together, and it makes this chlorine trifluoride stuff. Now, this reaction has heat as a product. Is that exothermic or endothermic? Exothermic, well done. If heat was a reactant, it would be endothermic. So here we're raising the temperature, all right? And raising the temperature is like adding heat to the reaction. So if heat is a product, do you think there won't be any change? Do you think it will shift left? Or do you think that by adding heat, you'll have it shift to the right? Good. If you add a react a product, if you add heat, it's going to shift to the opposite side. Le Chatelier's principle, you add something, it moves to the opposite side. So we're adding heat, adding, raising the temperature is adding heat, all right? It's going to shift to the opposite side. So if you really want to make chlorine trifluoride, you don't want to raise the temperature. You want to keep it a little bit lower. That's that how chemists are thinking about these reactions. Maybe you don't want chlorine trifluoride, and that's good. Raise the temperature. On the other hand, if you do want chlorine trifluoride, raising the temperature probably not the best idea. Any questions on that? All right. <clears throat> if you have a gas, you can also do things with volume and pressure. Now, solutions, which also play a part in equilibrium, they uh, aren't affected by this. But if you have a gas, volume and pressure will change the equilibrium. Now, let's look at this reaction right here, N2O4 and two NO2s. Does anybody remember from Chem 222 roughly what the volume is of one mole of ideal gas? 2.4. Well done. Oh, you, oh, my heart pitter patters when I hear these things. I brought that back on. I really need to get a life. I know. Anyway, yeah, tw it, you don't know what has to really know that, but I am honored that you did remember. About 22.4 liters per mole of gas in the ideal world. All right. So if this is an ideal situation, and I'm sure it isn't, but we'll pretend it is. One mole on the left, 22.4 liters. Two moles of gas on the right, 44.8 liters. So there would be a lot more volume in a, if you had just simple equilibrium going on here for the NO2 than there would be for N2O4. So if you can change the pressure or the volume, this is big time a player, all right? If you have more volume, then the NO2 will dominate. NO2 actually wants to start dissociating then because it's happier, it's got more room to move around. On the other hand, if you squish the volume together, you can transfer gases from one to another, losing a little scupula kind of thing. Um, if you do that, then it's gonna favor the N2O4 because it takes up a lot less space. 
Now, pressure is the opposite. Pressure like pushes down on us all the time. We can't stand it. Anyway, if you have a lot of pressure, those two moles are going to want to squish together into one mole because they don't have to deal with the pressure as much. On the other hand, less pressure, then everything relaxes. It'll start to go that way. So when you're thinking about gases and pressure and volume, look at the stoichiometries, all right? Two moles here, one mole there, all right? So low, uh, excuse me, high, thanks for playing, low pressure, high volume is going to favor the side with more moles of gas. And the opposite is true uh, if you have less moles. A sealed flask contains three molecules of nitrogen dioxide for every one of dinitrogen tetroxide and the system is at equilibrium. If we then transfer the mixture to a flask with a smaller volume, NO2 molecules convert to N2O4 molecules, resulting in a net decrease in the number of molecules. In this way, the system compensates for the decrease in volume by a decrease in gas pressure. One time a few years ago, I walked into 1303, but I think it was Chem 222, I'm not sure. All the chairs were gone. We had these annoying 1970s plastic chairs, all gone. And to this point, no one knows what happened to the orange chairs. It's an urban legend at Mount Hood. So anyway, for a couple of days, we had to move up to 2501, which is where we have lab. And my class was bigger at that time. And you know, everybody kind of spread out in this room, but boy, in 2501, you could really feel it. it was a whole different vibe there for a while until they got some temporary chairs. I point that in here because, yeah, if you change the volume that you're used to, like the volume of this room is pretty big, and the volume of 2501 is quite different. So it absolutely changed the dynamic and stuff of things. Uh, friends would have to sit next to each other, and all of you do a pretty good job of that as this. But anyway, in a smaller room, then you'd have to kind of condense down. All right, enough of my personal stories today. I'm really sorry. Anyway, here's another example with this chlorine trifluoride thing. All right, um, yeah. And we're going to decrease the volume of the flask here and what's going to happen. All right, so if you see anything about increasing, decreasing volume and pressure, the first thing to do is make sure that you have gases. Because if this was a solution, AQ things, no effect. All right, but these are gases. Second thing, see that what the stoichiometry of the gases are on both sides. So the ClF3, there's two moles right there. And on the reactant side, you have three plus one. You have four moles of gas. So that's what you want to think about when you see volume and pressure questions. We're decreasing the volume, all right? So we're shrinking it down. And you don't really want to have four moles of gas because that's a lot of volume you would rather have two moles of gas. So this one will definitely shift you to the right, all right? And again, notice what we did there. We first made sure we had gases. If there's solutions, no effect. Next thing, count up the total moles of gas. So three plus one, four moles of gas. Product side, two moles of gas. So less moles of gas on the product side. We're, shift, we're decreasing the volume. We're pushing the molecules together. If you want to think about that way, definitely going to see a shift to the right, to the product side. Questions? Okay. Now, on a real practical level, you can think about things like this. And the Haber-Frisch reaction is this thing where they made ammonia. It kept Germany in World War I. I babbled about it already this term. I'm sorry. But anyway, this is a reaction that's really important in industry. Ammonia is the precursor for making fertilizers as well as weapons, horrible things like that. But anyway, the equilibrium constant has definitely been studied intensely. The equilibrium constant at room temperature, 3.5 times 10 to the eighth. So, when this reaction is kicking in, it, kicking it together, will we end up, when we put things together, will we end up with more ammonia or more nitrogen and hydrogen? Is K a product favored K or a reactant favored K? Product favored. If K is greater than one, that means product favored. And product favored means you'll have more product, the stuff on the right, than you'll have reactant. Now, if this would have been 3.5 times 10 to the minus 8, 
that would have been a reactant favored K. And then we'd have more of these two species. But in this case, yeah, this is a very product favored K. If you mix these together, you should end up with more ammonia than you have nitrogen and hydrogen. Questions on that? You said uh, that K is greater than one, it's product favored. That's right, that's right. And K will never be negative coding, okay? And it won't be zero, but it can be anywhere less than one down to zero. <laughs> and that's actually a bigger magnitude than you might think. And all of those numbers would be reactive. Now, this is so important that people have done a lot of stuff with catalysts, trying to make the conversion go even faster. And these are usually industry secrets, but people feel that the catalyst is some kind of mixture of iron and potassium hydroxide. I have no idea what the mechanism is, but they apparently makes it go faster. Now, if you are a chemist trying to make ammonia, all right, the powers that be are gonna want you to make as much ammonia as you can. So we can use the Le Chatelier's principle to make some suggestions as to how to maximize your K value. All right, really get the most of it out of it that you can. Now, <clears throat> if you are just changing the concentrations, adding reactant or product, taking away reactant or product, you're not changing the K value. If you change the temperature, you will change the K. But with concentration changes, you're just gonna change the relative position of reactants and products. And so in order to do that, we're gonna use a YouTube, and not the cool YouTube with cat videos and my silly lecture videos, but we're gonna use a true water YouTube. It's got like a U part in the middle. And initially, due to gravity, the concentrations, if you will, of everything are gonna be constant. But notice how the left-hand side is a little bit whiter than the right side. That's trying to represent the fact that in this reaction, there are four moles of reactant relative to two moles of product. So pretend, if you will, that the reactant side is uh, four moles and the product side is two moles, but equilibrium is maintained. Now, why that's important is that we can pretend what's gonna happen if you say take out product or if you add reactant or something like that. I'll show you what I mean by that. When we add water to the tank on the left, the water in the tank on the right moves up and that on the left moves down. The water moves from left to right. So we say that equilibrium shifts to the right as it would if we added more reactants to a reversible chemical system. So adding a reactant moves the reaction to the product side. You still have the same equilibrium, but you can see how you've now made more product than there was before. Reactants go down a little bit as they make product. So if you're working for a company that makes ammonia, you would absolutely say, wow, add all the reactant you can, because that will shift the reaction to the product side by Le Chatelier's principle. You'll be able to make more ammonia. So let's say that we want to add chlorine to this reaction, the chlorine trifluoride. Will that have no change? Will it shift it to the right or will it shift it to the left? Shift to the right, well done. If you add something, it shifts to the opposite side. We're adding a reactant, it's gonna shift to the right side, you would make more ClF3, that's right. So again, add something, it moves to the opposite side. Removing water from the left tank causes water to move from the right tank to the left. Equilibrium shifts to the left, as it does in a reversible chemical system when we reduce the quantity of the reactants. Now, if your colleague says, oh, I think uh, removing some nitrogen and hydrogen would be a good idea, you could tell them, um, no, I don't think so, because when you remove something, it moves to the side that you remove the chemical. So if you start taking out the N2 and H2, the ammonia that's there is going to shift to the left-hand side. So removing a chemical in Le Chatelier's principle, you move the equilibrium to that particular side. And in this case, that would give you less ammonia. That's not gonna be looked on favorably. So here's the same kind of question. We're removing now a reactant, F2. 
if you remove a reactant, the reaction's going to shift to the side that you removed. You're going to see a shift to the left. Adding water to the right tank causes the water of the left tank to rise as water moves from the right tank to the left. Equilibrium in the system shifts to the left as it would if we added product to a reversible reaction. So that same colleague says, well, that one didn't work, but let's try adding some ammonia to it. Well, duh, of course that's not going to work. Anyway, you add something, the reaction shifts to the opposite side. So you add ammonia, adding a product, it's going to shift to the reactant side. So that also won't make more happen. So this is the same kind of problem. You're adding a product, ClF3. It's going to shift to the opposite side from what you did. It's going to shift to the left-hand side. All right. And big surprise, there's one Removing more. water from the right tank lowers the water level of the left tank as water moves from left to right to regain an equilibrium. The equilibrium shifts to the right as it would in a reversible chemical reaction if we subtracted product from the system. So you take ammonia away, the reaction will shift to the side that you remove from. That'll make more NH3. So the punchline here is that if you're working for this, you want to add as much N2 as H2 as you can, because that'll shift to the right side. And you also want to take the ammonia away as soon as possible. That'll also shift the reaction to the right. You'll make more ammonia, get lots of big bucks. All right, on uh, Monday, we'll do the last example here. Where we'll talk about adding another chemical in this reaction. Thanks for being here. Have a great week.